1976, our youth united against one common issue that was marginalizing them, being forced to study Afrikaans in schools. Today, in this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the current issues that are marginalizing the youth, as well as issues that they have taken a stand against and those to follow. So in light of June 16, and if we just reflect on the youth of 76 mm. and the reason why they were marching, you know, some people, we can look at it in black and white and say that they were protesting against learning Afrikaans in schools, but I think it was way greater than that. When you are forced to learn in a language that isn't your own, there is a barrier to your education. Yeah. And it is inevitably making your access to your education and your access to your future that much more difficult to achieve mm. and to get. And so if we speak about, you know, when we're in the medical space, please just explain to me the importance of accessibility, especially for young people of today and why you have chosen to sort of target this um, area. Yeah. I like how you make reference to, you know, the youth of 1976. I think in Sam Zimmer's picture, what you can see or what he says when he elaborates is that when he took the photo, Hector Peterson was being held and the idea was the first thing they said was we need to get him to a clinic. And you, then in picture you see them putting, trying to get him into a car. And in that really sums up the conversation, right? Is that what is the idea of access to healthcare now based on what it was all those years back? Because my argument is that things are pretty much still the same in modern day South Africa as they were in 1976 from an accessibility of health perspective. Um, you must remember that there are a lot of things that influence how you access healthcare. Your socioeconomic status, whether you have money to access it, your po population sort of location, where you stay, are you close to a facility that can give you that? And once you're there, are the services of a high quality or are they of limited nature? And that's really the disparity we're seeing between sort of rural and urban settings. And so when we, when I founded my, my, my company, MediHealth Solutions, what we prioritized to do was we wanted to re-engineer the healthcare space for adolescents and young adults. And yes. what we're doing by doing that is we're targeting those specifically in private accommodation spaces. As you know, the burden of students can't get into residence structures. They're not funded in that nature. A lot of them are not on any bursary schemes, are not on any medical aids. And so you've got a big population of students that are wandering around and don't really have an identity from a healthcare perspective. Yes. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to create a safe, stigma-free, um, you know, a, a, an environment that can allow them to access healthcare without the pressure or burden of having to think about the barriers to entrance. So what I mean by that is we've established a, a, a on-site medical facility within the private accommodation space where learners don't have to actually leave home to get access or to mm -hmm. seek medical attention. The reality right now is that if you're a woman, a young woman who's staying in Bramfontein, who happens to be three, four months pregnant, and you start bleeding in your room, you have to displace yourself from that and go to Hillbrow Clinic. <sighs> yeah. And these are the current challenges that exist. Within that, you can already see transport, socioeconomic status, quality of healthcare services, all those barriers that I touched on earlier have now come into the play within one single moment. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to decongest that. We wanted to make it easy for them to seek attention without them feeling as though they're in a stigma-filled environment. And so in doing that, you give the power back to them. And I think for a large body of people who are otherwise overlooked, giving them that access and giving them that, that, that space to be proud of something goes far longer than giving them money in their pockets. I think that's actually something very important to highlight, that there's a gray area when we speak about accessibility because we have people that are very, students specifically, that are very mm. disadvantaged and so they have the access to the healthcare that is provided for them. But then there's the gap that is sort of in between where, like you said, there are students who are in private accommodation and they don't have access to those certain things. Sure. What do you think the effects are on somebody that is in that situation? Because we do speak about how, when we're speaking about um, school children, yeah. right? Girls, because they don't have simple things like sanitary pads, aren't able to go to school for weeks mm. and they miss so much 
time, education time, because of something so simple. What do you see, especially with children that are in tertiary, tertiary students, mm -hmm. and that gray area? Because I think that's something that we don't speak about a lot when it comes to accessibility. Yeah, I mean, look, I think, I think from, from an organizational perspective, what we wanted to do was exactly that, was to bridge that gray. And so how we've done it is that we've actually simplified the consultation process. Um, so now, real-time booking, when you're in your res room, you can log on to the web app and make an appointment to see the doctor without having to actually even show up um, at the desk. The whole system is actually end-to-end. -end. It's a paperless system. You get there, there's facial recognition, identification. Um, that will pick up, bring up your profile, fast track it to go and see the doctor or the nurse, and then print out an electronic script, all within 25 minutes of your presentation. So what we've done there is you've, you've, you've given dignity to the process and dignity to that particular adolescent or young adult um, and made sure that even if they're not able to leave their rooms, we can still get access, they can still get healthcare. Mm. Um, and, and, and I really think that from on a broader perspective, you know, it, it speaks more to what we're saying is that we're, turning, we're trying to turn back the times where, you know, you have to, you have to sit there and wonder, you know, because I'm unwell, Am I going to be able to even work or live or go to school? Because remember that these are people who are going to directly inject into the economy of this country. Exactly. And if they're not financially active or not able to be financially active because of ailments that have been sort of delaying them, then it causes a big problem for the economy. An example I'll make is one mental health care, right? A big area that's overlooked, yes. especially in the times of COVID, especially in the times that we're living in now. You know, when you have, when you are carrying a mental uh, ailment and it's an undiagnosed mental in it, it can be very difficult for you to even function on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what we've done is that on Wednesdays, we block out the entire day just to mental matters, okay. where we allow them 12 free follow-ups for the year, you know, to see a psychologist, to see a therapist, to see a psychiatrist. And the beauty of the model is that the end user does not pay a single cent. You touched on mental health. Yeah. And the fact that you even specifically dedicate a Wednesday yeah. to mental matters. And we actually have had this conversation before on Culture Conversations, where it is so important for us to take care of our mental health. That is what health care is. Yeah. And especially when we're speaking about young people who are the future of our country, of mm. our world. There are future leaders, doctors and whatever. And I actually recently read a UNICEF report. Yeah. Um, they, they released a press release earlier this week and they actually said that um, the issues that are affecting children the most right now is anxiety. Yeah. Young people are uncertain about their futures, especially because of COVID. And one of the biggest things that they've been, that is affecting that is the fact that they are in violent environments. Yes. And so I just want to go into just the effects of COVID that you've seen and the fact that UNICEF can, UNICEF can even release a report like that, mm. saying that anxiety is literally eating at young people. Yeah. And so what exactly have you seen, especially with COVID um, having, coming into play and the fact that we're in the third wave now you yeah. know i think we all thought that oh gosh it's almost over <laughs> and we were just hit with it again mm. how badly was the healthcare system affected how badly have you seen young people being affected by this yeah i think um what 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 covid has shown us is that it it doesn't follow a, a memo right and Initially, we thought that people over the age of 60 with multiple comorbidities are the people who are most likely to contract and eventually die from COVID-19. But what the current trends are showing us, especially within the third wave, is it's the young people that are affected parties. It's the young people that are carrying the virus. It's the young people who the virus is now molded around. So it's learned, and it's learned from either social behavior, um, from, you know, people not really in taking instructions on hand washing, on hygiene and social distancing, um, but at the same time, it's maybe it's following social patterns. So what we know is that young people are obviously the most mobile and they will go and you say, no, I'm going to my friend and then you guys go somewhere else and then you go to an event. And, and all the while, you're actually creating a contact list. I've long spoken about the impacts of COVID on mental health care. And, and if anything, what we know is that COVID has exposed more that people actually have quite deep-rooted mental health issues. 
And, and, and what I mean by that is now you're forcing people to stay in home. You're forcing people to be in an environment that perhaps they were never really immersed in before. And now they actually have to tackle and face their demons on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. So I think, what, what is your take on that in the sense of like, how exactly should we really be dealing with this as young people? So I think, I think one thing about young people that, 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 that we all know is that young people don't like being talked down to. Um, you know, they, they don't like being lectured to in terms of what, how they should live their lives. And so what we should be doing is we should be instilling change agents within their spaces, um, right? Um, and so what we used to do when we were in school is that uh, in, in order to learn about HIV and AIDS and counselling, they made you a peer counsellor, mm -hmm. literally. And they said, okay, let's impart the skills and the strategies with you who is within that space and as much as you guys can go, when somebody is at raise and they talk about, oh, yesterday I had sex and was like this, you as the peer, it's easier for you to relate with them and say, actually, did you know that when you use a condom, you reduce, you know, your chances of developing STDs? And so it becomes easier than them having to leave and go ask somebody who they don't relate to completely and say, listen, I had sex outside, but now I don't know what to do. You know, and I think even in this conversation, I, I don't think that as a body of science, as a body of medicine, we have, we have a right to, to, to sort of just talk down to people. I think we should, we should be invested in the conversations and ask ourselves on the ground level, what are we doing to be a part of those conversations? And the biggest thing I have and the biggest cry I have, especially within the country, is that a lot of the people that come onto TV to talk about COVID, to talk about the numbers, to talk about the stats, you're dealing with people 60 plus, you're dealing with people 55 plus, you're dealing with professors, you're dealing with... And so young people can't relate to those people. Yeah. Young people see a professor on TV and they're like, ah, man, yeah, we know, wear a mask, wash your hands, and that's it. But they'll continue, it won't actually change their behavior. Yes. And so if you don't have catalysts of change in their immediate spaces, then you're not going to get anywhere. And I think that's where these type of establishments, such as the ones we want to launch, are very important because you're now having a space where young people can interact freely and within there you can instill education to make sure that they can change their circles next to them. Sure. Wow. Um, I think taking away from this conversation, I think, is that as young people, we need to be change agents within our own communities and within our own friend groups. And that is how essentially we will affect change with simple things yeah. like going to group <laughs> and healthcare yeah. and all of that. So thank you so much for coming. I've taken so much away from this conversation. And I think as we develop in the rest of the conversation that we have in this episode, we're going to sort of unpack and understand what really it, what it really means to be a young person in South Africa today. Yeah. And touching on that last point, I think it's something that is very important. Yeah. So thank you for that insight because you've actually contributed um, to my day. What an enlightening conversation we had with Dr. Amo. He offered so much insight into what accessibility to healthcare really is. And he even demystified the gray areas that we have. I think he touched on a lot about the fact that it's dependent on your socioeconomic status as well. He also brought up the fact that we really need to have so catalysts for social change within our immediate circles, because if we don't, then real change won't ever come to be. That was part one of the season finale. Make sure to stay tuned for part two, where I have a conversation with Miss Soweto 2020, Tobile Stein. Peace out.